All right, so today we're going to talk about logos and logo design. And I think it's kind of a fun transition. The last two classes, you were kind of bogged down with learning the pen tool and working to create the font and going through the basic letters and whatever. It's kind of like when you're in 130 and you have to do those pages of letter practice. I don't know, maybe they don't make you do it in 130 anymore, but where you have to practice each character over and over, and it's just boring. So today we're going to try to spice things up a little bit. And I'm going to talk for quite a while about logo design and, and strategies and things you might want to do. I'll talk about the trends in logo design right now. Um, if you did a logo in 130, which I think you guys still have to do, you can base what you're working on today on that logo, or you can create something entirely new. Chances are the 130 logo was a little bit on the simplistic side because you had to repeat it so many times. You, you tried to distill it down. Obviously, when we get into the computers, repeating it's never a problem anymore. Um, so you can feel free to have some fun with it today. Uh, and it's also it's kind of a fun way of really showing how the pen tool works and, and your capabilities. And it'll get you ready uh, for where we're going in the class and, and get you prepared for Charlie Harper and that sort of thing. We will cover the Pathfinder tool, which I think is a very, very valuable tool. Um, and I'll show you how that works a little bit later on, but it has to do with how you combine shapes and cut shapes out and, and that sort of thing. So we'll talk through that today as well. Um, but before we get into the technicalities of Illustrator, we want to talk about logo design. So an effective logo is fundamentally distinctive and appropriate for whatever it is that you're, you're, you're designing the logo for. It should be practical. It's going to be very graphic. Simple is generally better. If you think for a moment, and I'm going to show you so many logos today that you've seen a thousand times, 10,000 times in your life, and when we kind of talk about it, you'll say, well, wait a minute, now I understand. Sometimes the simplest logos are the ones that stick with you the best. Sometimes they're a little bit more complicated. And depending on what message you're trying to convey, it can work or it cannot work. So here's, here's some logos that we see on an everyday basis. Some are more effective than others. Some have been around for so long that they start to be ingrained in culture. So the NBC logo, for example, the peacock. Who knows why it was a peacock, what that had to do with television in the first place, but it became something that was very standardized, and now we're used to seeing it such that we recognize it as a TV network. You know, ABC. It's about as simple as it gets in terms of a logo. Three letters in a black circle. Not much to it. But it still works. It's a very iconic example. You know, when you get over into the Rolling Stones example, it was the kind of logo that was very obvious for a certain generation of people. You guys are probably on the tail end. You might not have even recognized it because they're so old. And so that, that kind of thing changes over time. VW, I think, is a very creative logo. We have the, the Volkswagen, the VW in the logo, but at the same time, it looks kind of graphic in its nature. Shell gas station, what the shell has to do with gas, who knows? But it's a very iconic. It doesn't even have any lettering in it. And we recognize, oh, that's a gas station. So it shows you the power of a logo because you don't even need lettering or text to understand that that's a gas station. It's so ingrained in us. So when you start to think about designing your own logo, you want to have that same kind of power, something that represents you. So you want easy recognition of a logo. It should be versatile. It should be memorable. What makes it stand out against the field of other logos? It often features something unique, unexpected, whatever. Sometimes that can work to your advantage as well. OK, so let's look at this. Chances are at least one of you went there this morning. Anybody go there this morning? I did. <laughs> OK. This is something that if we really stop and look at this, if we really look at this lady with a crown, with some kind of weird sleeve looking things, maybe on the side with long hair, does this have anything to do with coffee? Nothing. Nothing whatsoever. Yet it is so ingrained in our, in our, in our psyche that we immediately associate this with coffee. We immediately associate it with the smell of a Starbucks. It's just this brand icon. And so in, 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 in this particular context, would I argue that this is um, you know, a perfect example of a simple logo? No, it's actually a very complicated logo. But given that it's reprinted so many times in so many places, 
we've become associated with it. If I didn't show you this, and I said to all of you, draw the Starbucks logo, you'd sit there and you'd go, I don't know, it's kind of a green circle in all likelihood. But this is very, very recognizable, and that's part of the power of branding. I'm going to show you the main examples, the Starbuckses and the Apple computers and that sort of thing, and we'll talk through all of those. But I'm also going to throw up some bizarre ones that you haven't seen before, because sometimes you need to think a little bit outside the box. You're creating your own brand. You can't just copy a Shell logo, for example. So sometimes they're creative. Sometimes they come up with something like this, but at the same time, they're very iconic. I could see t-shirts with this printed on it, but I don't know what the company is. But it's a cool logo. I like this one, the fish bomb fish, fishing shop. I don't know. It's kind of fun. And it's very, it's, it's very memorable. It's the kind of thing that you're going to look back on and say, yeah, I remember that brand, assuming it was a brand. You want it to be enduring. So if you follow a fad, you do a logo that's really trendy at a certain period of time, is it going to last forever? Can you adapt it and make it last forever? And I'm going to show you an example in just a second. If you're a company, let's say you're Twitter, and you're coming up with your logo, or you're Facebook, and you're coming up with your logo, you think about that logo as something that's going to endure. Let's assume for a second that you want your company to be around 10 years, 20 years, 50 years. Is your logo going to withstand that breadth of time? Or do you, are you going to need to modify it? Are you going to need to change it? So something like the Twitter bird, I think it could. It's a very simple design. Maybe some color changes, it could work. So what if on the back of our phones, this was on it? It's a little different than what we see as the Apple logo. So way back when, this was the original Apple computer logo. I would argue that the company might not have survived if they didn't change their logo. A lot of Apple is about branding. It's about identity. It's about those kinds of things. And if this was their logo, if you picked up your phone and you looked at the back of it and that's what you saw, it's not quite what they're going for. So let's take a look at Apple Computer as a case study, because I think it's a really fun example, particularly because they started with such a whacked out original one. So let's look at it in context. OK, so here we are. The original Apple logo, right? It's Isaac Newton. There's a little uh, apple that's falling on his head kind of thing. OK, so that's the original one. Then we move in 1976. A lot of you were not born in 1976. We moved to the rainbow Apple logo, and this survived until 1998. So this is a pretty long tenure of an original logo. And obviously, they needed to do some modifications. Right in there, 1998-ish, was when Apple Computer was about to die. Okay, You guys remember the story, probably. Heck, probably some of you weren't even born then. This is scary, right? Maybe not. Maybe you were like a toddler. So in the late 90s, Apple Computer was literally a couple months away from dissolving as a company, a couple months away from going bankrupt. And at the time, Steve Jobs wasn't part of the company. He founded the company, then he left. And this company was tanking. They had too many products. They were doing too many things. They were doing a terrible job at the things they were doing. It was confusing. And Steve Jobs stepped back in. They said, can you come back and fix us? And he stepped back in and he completely changed the company. He turned them from about to die to one of the most profitable, profitable or the most valuable company in the world, which they are right now, you know, depending on how the markets are. Pretty cool. But as part of that transformation, he said, we're, we're getting rid of the past. We're staying in the same vein, but we're going away from this rainbow apple and we're moving forward. We're, we're rebranding ourselves a little bit. Same logo. We're just taking away the color. So from 1998 to 2000, we went away from the rainbow into the, the solid apple. Then we moved 2001 to 2007 into the shiny apple. That was kind of the design trend at that point, a little bit of 3D, little shadow, et cetera. There's actually a, a series of articles that talk about logo design trend every year, and they recap. And it's pretty funny to see how it changes over time. And we'll talk about that a little bit further on. So we get to that, that nice shiny apple 
as we're going forward. That goes 2001 to 2007. That covers the introduction of the iPod, the introduction of the iPhone, right? Big, big products for Apple. That's the logo that's, that's part of them. Then we move forward into 2007. We get into, uh, this, this graphic is a little bit old. I say 2007 to present. They've actually updated it since. I would, uh, they updated it in, oh, what was it, 2014, I think, they changed it. I'm going to have to go back and, and get my exact, and I, maybe I have a slide that says it. But we had this, the shine was still there, but it was much more subtle. And then they moved back into the completely flat version that we see today that is this. So we've gone, we've gone flattening, we've gone more simplistic, but still all of us recognize this as a brand. It's very, very obvious as a brand. So if we, if we reverse and we think about that original logo to what it is today, it's very, very different. So when you're designing a logo, you want to think through that. Think through how your logo is going to endure the test of time. So if we look at the logo design process, this is very, very similar to any design process, whether we're doing architectural design, whether we're doing um, logo design, graphic design, industrial design, whatever it is, similar process. We start with that design brief that tells us what exactly we're supposed to be doing. We move into a research phase, followed by a reference phase. Then we get into the sketching and conceptualization. We get those ideas out and try to see what's working. We reflect on those ideas, and finally, we present those ideas to a particular client. Little, little bubble diagram here that talks about how much time is spent in various steps. The sketching and conceptualization step is obviously the big one. That's where we're doing the primary design work in this. So design brief, you're going to question the client first, what exactly do you want? You hire me to do a logo design. What is it that I'm, I'm going to be doing for you? What, what's this logo going to look like? That sort of thing. You want to question that client. And in this case, today, you're going to be designing a logo for yourself. So you're going to question yourself. What's my purpose? What am I doing this logo for? Where is it going to go? Those kinds of things. If you think about where it's going to go, sometimes it helps you think about what the size should be, what it should look like. Should it be a square? Should it be a rectangle? Is it going to go on a t-shirt? Is it going to be letterhead? It's also a good time to talk about how much it's going to cost. So since you're charging yourself today, you can bump those fees way up. You know, Go get yourself a Starbucks afterwards, right? Then we move into the research phase. And again, I think this is one of the fun phases, because then it's just Google searching, what's going on, what's, what's trending in the industry. You're designing it maybe as an architecture student. What are other people that are students designing? When you were in 130 and people drew different logos, was somebody's logo so much better than everybody else? You're like, why didn't I think of that? You want to think about those kinds of things. Google is your best friend here. Google image search is awesome. So maybe you're going to look at architecture firms. What do their logos look like? What seems appropriate? What are the current trends? That's in the industry. What's the history of your previous logos? So if you're Apple computer and you look at that first logo, do I want to go back to that? No, I don't want to do that. How can I modify my existing logo? You can do the same thing. Look at your 130 logo. Ooh, I don't want that one anymore. You can change it. But at some point in your career, you're going to start to say, this is my logo. This is what represents me. It's kind of like your signature. right? You start signing documents, and before you know it, you're old. And you have a signature. And you probably started that signature when you were 20 years old. And then you look at it, and you're like, eh, I don't know. I can't even read it. And you're like, well, that's how I always sign things. It starts to become part of you. And you want to think about it now for the future. What are your competitors using for their logo? What are your other students using? Do you like any of those? How do they work for them? Then we move into the reference phase. This is where you, instead of looking specifically at architecture student logos, you branch out and say, what are effective logos in general? Maybe you do a Google search for trendy logos 2017. I don't know. You do a logo search, and you start to see what's going on. What are the current styles? Is it flat? Are there shadows? Is it shiny? Is it not? What are those kinds of things, and how can that inform my design process? Research is always fun. 
Then we move into this sketching and conceptualization phase. This is where we develop our ideas and start to see what looks good and what doesn't look good. You can't, you can't dismiss it until you try it. So you explore a, var a variety of ideas. Remember back to that intuition thing that we talked about? I spent a whole lecture talking about that. It's that thing that guides you that's not rational thought. It says, yeah, that's pretty good. Or no, that's not quite working. Rely on that in this exercise. Fall back to your research and reference steps. Go back and look. How's it working? Produce lots of ideas. And I'm going to show you an example. So in this case, I want to create a logo. So I start with a photo. Then I conceptualize a little bit. I, I sketch out a little bit what's going on. And I say, I, this wasn't me. I b found these online. But we're going to pretend it's me for right now for the sake of this argument. Sketch it out. What's it look like? Is it, is it easy to reproduce? How, should it be a little bit flatter? Those kinds of questions. Then maybe I could conceptualize it a little bit more, a little bit more graphic. Take it a step further. OK, this is abstracting it a little bit. It's starting to work. And let's take it into Illustrator, see what I can do in Illustrator. OK, well, it's starting to be just a series of shapes now. It's starting to evolve into that logo. Maybe let's rotate it over to the side a little bit. Let's create a little bit of outlining. OK, it's starting to look pretty good. So from the photograph, I'm translating it all the way through into a graphic logo. Then maybe I want to start playing around with text or, or, gra or, or something that identifies me or my company. How does that fit in? Does the font match? Does it look right? Try a variety of fonts. This is all through that conceptualization and sketching phase. What about if you want to do it in color versus grayscale versus black and white? How do all those fit together? What makes it look good and what doesn't? How would that then be applied to a whole series of things? Business cards, stationery, those kinds of things. Could it go on a t-shirt? Where is it being applied? Again, starting out in sketch form. Lots of ideas. If you need to take out a piece of paper today and sketch it for a little bit, do it. Nothing wrong with that. Vivid ways, two different logos. Which one's working? Which one feels right? Okay, So let's walk through the creation of this. This is, again, an illustrator, starting with the basic curves, starting to play around with the color. We're going with the color spectrum here and the gradients. A little bit of subtle shadowing to add that three-dimensionality to it. Font choice. Remember, we spent a whole class talking about fonts and font choice. Here's three different examples. They look really close, don't they? Which one is the best? Which one identifies you the best? Try those out and see. One's going to be better than the others. <coughs> Creating outlines from it to make a few modifications. And then it ultimately ends up in the final stages of the logo. Thinking about it in color versus in black and white. Well, if you take away the color and we get to the black and white version, you have to do something to make it have the same three dimensionality to it. So simply adding those little white lines add that three-dimensional flair. So it can be something that simple that can work for the logo in black and white. Then we get into the final stage, which is the reflection stage. This is, this is really, really, well, it's not quite the final, second to final, because you have to present it, too. We get into the reflection stage. You need to step away from your work. Is it working? Does it look good? Right? You step back. How does it feel? This is also a great place to ask your neighbors or colleagues friends for their opinions. Obviously, you want somebody who will give you their honest opinion, right? not the kind of opinion like when my wife asks, do you like these shoes? And I say yes, no matter what they look like. Not that kind of opinion. You want an honest opinion. Okay, So even as part of your exercise today, and you'll see it, it's listed part three, talk to your neighbor. It's even on the handout. You have to do it today. Talk to your neighbor. Get some feedback. How's it look? What could I do different? That's going to make you far better as a designer, have a far better logo, et cetera. I'm going to go off on a tangent for just a second, because I think it's important to, in a design context, in this school, in schools that you go forward to, it's important to recognize 
good collaborative culture and how it works. And so when I was going back to grad school, uh, I went to Berkeley for grad school. And um, you know, I had gone to Berkeley as an undergrad, and so I had one perspective. This was, how this was how design school was. This is how architecture school was. This was my expectation. And so I was sitting around about halfway through the first semester with one of my good friends uh, who was in grad, grad school with me. And she said, you know, Berkeley is so different. She went to MIT undergrad, and she was probably the top of the MIT class and was clearly the top of the Berkeley class. I mean, ridiculously good. And I was like, what do you mean? Why is Berkeley so different? I'm like, you know, what is it? The weather's nicer, or you know what? She's like, no. No, the design school philosophy is fundamentally different. She said, when we were at MIT, when we were working as undergrads, everything was very private. Like, you would, you would keep your ideas close. You didn't want to share them with any of your friends or your neighbors because you were afraid somebody was going to steal the idea. That was the culture. That was the way it worked. And I said, well, that's weird, because Berkeley was completely the opposite. And she said, yeah, as, you know, here in grad school, I get that now. And I didn't have that other side of the experience. But this is a very collaborative design school. She said, I feel comfortable showing you or anybody else in studio my ideas because I know you're not going to take them. You're instead going to talk to me about what could make them better because it's very much a fundamental collaborative process. And to me, the design process has to be collaborative for you to be any good at what you're doing. And the same thing happens in an office. If you can't communicate to the people in your firm and you can't all collaborate, you're not going to have as good a quality work. So I just think it's a very interesting sidebar. And this is a good point to, to, to actually talk about it. Because you in this school have to develop that culture. You have to find a way to talk to each other. You have to make yourselves better. And I can tell you right now, there are classes that are better and worse at this. And you guys are still too young for me to have an assessment on how you guys are going to be. But there was a class, uh, I'd say, four or five years ago where they were very collaborative. They worked well together. All of them were top producers. And you go back and you look at the, the people. There was a whole group of them that went to Cal Poly. And they're all really successful at what they did. And it's partly because of this philosophy. And so I would obviously encourage you to, to do that as well. But you have to today because it's on your handout. Mandated. I love this logo. I think it's the coolest. So sometimes you can put these little carrots in it where you can do, you know, in this case, it's the hands, and then the rabbit is in between the hands, but it's the negative space of the positive space. It's, I don't know, it's fun. It doesn't always work that way, but in some cases it does. I wish Grabbit was a real company. Then we get into the presentation phase. This is when you, after you've developed your ideas, you get down to, this is the final idea, and I need to present it to my client. In this case, you're presenting it to yourself, so it's kind of a moot point. But if you were designing for somebody, we're designing the logo for the Mall of America, you have to go to the corporate board and say, here's the new logo. What do you think? And you have to be prepared for them not to like it or to argue your point of why this is good. If the client doesn't like it, ultimately they're paying the bills, guess what? You're doing it again. Sometimes it's an evolution of ideas. So here's Mall of America. We have the basic strategy up here on the top, the star, the folded star right there. You could unwrap the pieces. You could unwrap it so that there's little tails coming off of it. You could wrap it a little bit tighter. So there's variants on the same logo, but it's in the same vocabulary. And that's critical. You could also, down here, change the logo based on time of year, color choice. It's 4th of July, red, white, and blue. It's Christmas time, it's red and green. right? It's some kind of an anniversary, you do it all in silver. And you could also take it and use it as a backdrop for other prints. So this evolution of what the logo can become is really critical. And certainly for something like a mall to be able to have these variants is a pretty good strategy from the designer's perspective. So what brands succeed and why? So I have the Nike swoosh up here. Nike didn't have some kind of magical transformation like Apple did from a really ugly logo into their, their current logo. This is Nike. It's been Nike from when I was a kid. This is Nike. Look at this logo for a second. 
It's about as simple as it gets. That's it. No text, just that. And we all immediately associate it with shoes, clothing, etc. Pretty crazy that it can be that simple. So if you succeed, why, does you, why do you succeed? This might be because it's so darn simple. Typography. Some logos are purely text-based. And I'll show you a bunch of examples of those. If it is purely text-based, the font is absolutely critical. If the font isn't right and it's text-based, it's not going to work. Sometimes you have to create your own font. You also want to think about, is the logo going to go out of style? If you use papyrus as your font, you know I picked on that earlier. If you use papyrus as your font and the font goes out of fad, is your logo now out of fad? Yeah, probably so. So a lot of times, the font-based logos are the logo, and nobody else uses them. And I'll show you some examples in just a second. Sometimes you have to make your own font. Remember, if you're doing it this way and you want to load a custom font into these computers, you can do that. We did that last class. You can go ahead and do that. The little details obviously really, really matter if it's all font-based. So let's look at some of those iconic ones. Okay, Coca-Cola. Coke. It's a Coke font. That's what it is. And if you were to write something in a Coke font, you'd say, wait a minute, that's the Coke font. It's probably even more obvious in the Disney version. If you use the Disney font, it's going to be it's going to look like Disney because that font identifies with the brand. Actually, I think it's totally weird because the Y doesn't look like a Y. It's bugged me since I was a kid. I always thought Disney was spelled and ended with a P. And it just bothers me. But it is what it is. That's the font. CNN, NASA, IBM, those are all logos that are based on text. FedEx is one of my favorite logos out there. Anybody see the hidden gem in this one? Right? Ready? I'm going to blow your mind right now. Boom! You will never look at the FedEx logo the same way again. Brilliant design. You can see it just as FedEx, just as the text, but at the same time, we're going to go back in time here. Boom. There it is. There's the, there's the little extra arrow. So subtle, yet really well done. Those are the kinds of things that make a logo withstand the test of time. Dynamic dust, hard company to make a logo for. I don't even know if it's a real company. right? So how do you do that? What's dynamic dust? How does that work? Right? A lot of times, that's part of it, understanding what the name is, and then how does it evolve. I think this one's really done, really well done. It's very plain, very simple, type-based, but just the additions of the lines make it work really nice. You could see this as a letterhead. Just, it's really clean. You want to avoid the cliches. Okay, there's always the small business out there that use the Microsoft Word clip art as their logo. Well, guess what? Everybody who has Microsoft Word has that. Yep, that's the clip art. No cliches, no light bulbs for ideas, no globes for international. You do that kind of stuff, and it just it, it's, it's too classic. You need to branch out from that. Okay? The other factor is if you copy another logo, oh, I'm going to do this really cool logo. It's going to be Grant Adams in the Coca-Cola font. Yeah. It's always going to look like the Coke font. It's never going to be your logo. So you can't copy another logo. So you're really stuck with this innovation process. And that's part of the fun of it. When we get down to output files, we're looking at a 1,500 pixel by 1,500 pixel at 300 DPI. Generally, that's the size we want. Remember, based on the last class, we talked about vector versus raster graphics. You're creating a vector graphic. So you can always scale it up. But this is generally the size that we're looking for. When we do the output today, though, we're going to do 800 pixels by 800 pixels at 72 DPI. That's for our screen output. You can always save the AI file, and you always should, and go back to it, make it bigger, make it smaller. Remember, it's a vector-based graphic. 
Think also about black and white, grayscale, and or color. Today I'm only asking you to do one, but long term you want to be able to present your work, grayscale, black and white, color, depends on the, the logo uh, itself and the, the ultimate end result. So I'm going to flip through a bunch of logos to try to get you a little bit inspired, and then we'll talk about trends in just a second. Some of these are just funny. The Dyna table. I like that one. It's a good one. So here's another design process. Again, this isn't mine. A company called Jigsaw Internet. So you have to go through the conceptualization phase of well, what's this going to look like? <coughs> do I do all jigsaw pieces? How does that fit together? What looks right? Evolve it, and maybe it's a 3D, 3D model, eBay colors. I don't know. Doesn't quite feel right. Maybe we go back to um, just the blue scale. Font choice it just doesn't feel right, does it? Yeah, it's not there. Evolve. OK. A little nicer. Font's a little better. OK, starting to feel pretty good. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting take on it. So you do this evolution, and you start to see how it starts to fit together and how the, the overall brand might work. So it takes that evolution process. So logo design trends. So there's this great website which I referenced. These images are from this particular website. It's called logolounge.com. You can go there. They have a bunch of great uh, example logos that you can look at. But every year, he or she, I don't know the author, does a summary of the logo design trends. So this is the most current one. It's the 2016 version. At the end of 2017, he'll do the 2017 version to talk about what the trends are and what are people doing in the current logo design. And you can actually go back and see his archive. I think he started in 2003. So you can see how the, the logos have evolved over time. So one of the trends was this slow gradient of colors across the logo, starting from a lighter version and moving into a darker version. So this consistent color transformation. Another big one was circles and how the circles fit with the design concept. Then it was the half and half, the badge with the half in shadow, half not in shadow. You can do this really easily with a blending mode. You darken half the image. All right, so it's subtle, but it's a little bit of a half and half. The linked, the interconnectedness of things. Lots of examples of those kinds of pieces. Um, in this case, it's the folding loop. It's kind of like a link. But it's the infinite loop, right? So we look up here, for example, if I look up at this top one, right? If we started here, it would fold back on itself, fold back, come through, fold back, and end up back and folding on itself. So it's this continuous loop process. Same thing happens here. If we start here, we go over and under and over and back over and back there. You guys can't see it because it's on red, but you guys get the idea. Dog eared. Clipping the corners, lots of clipped corners, whether they're rounded clipped or whether they're they actually square clipped, chamfered or filleted, for example. Corners in general were a big trend. Using those corners and how they fit together with text. The dashed line. To me, the dashed line is always a little iffy in the design process because it's so thin. If we look down here at this projector scale, sorry, if I can, there we go. At this projector scale, look at that logo. Everything's just very thin. It's hard to, to discern that at distance. And so that's something you want to be aware of when you start to do that. This upper one works a little bit better because the, the dashed line is a thick dashed piece with a small gap instead of a thin piece. The shifting letters. Big trend. You've probably seen this like on the sides of buses and stuff. SF MoMA, for example, big proponent of this. Futurist, sharing the economy, sharing economy. That one's kind of fun because it shares the N. But you get the idea. It's the shifted letters. 
curls also. So a little bit of three-dimensionality to this. It'll be interesting to see where this goes and whether this kind of a trend continues or not, because we've been in such a flat UI for so long where we don't have these gradients right now. Um, so this is kind of new and, and changing a little bit. The pocket shield or the little emblem in the shield format, the rectangle on top, pointed bottom, very Chevron logo-esque. And the slices, lots of 3D pieces stacked up together. Letter block, again, very similar, this time based on a letter as part of the, the, the primary block. Vendors, this is a lot like the curls, same concept. Bars, re repetition of graphic elements. I think these are nicely done. OK, so we're going to switch over into the world of Illustrator. We're going to do some logo practice. Uh, what time is it? Yeah, we'll just go straight into it. So give me a second to, to switch over, and then we'll move on into logo design. OK, so I'm going to go ahead and open up uh, Adobe Illustrator and get that started. And once I have Illustrator open, I'm going to go to File and then New. And remember, we talked about the size that we were going to work from. We're not going to work on a letter size. We're going to do 1,500 pixels, PX, by 1,500 PX. There we go. Um, we want pixels as our units there. Once I'm done with this, we want one artboard. That's perfect. And we'll go ahead and say OK. And it gives me my page to start with. And so this is the general size that we're going to be working with today. If you started with the letter size, it's not the end of the world. Remember, we're in vector graphics, so we can always scale up or scale down uh -huh. as appropriate. So then, as I said before, we really need to start trying things out and seeing what works and what doesn't work. And so I'm going to create these from scratch. I have no idea with if, if what I create is going to be any good, but it's still part of the process. So we're going to, we're going to give it a go and see what happens. In order to keep somewhat organized, I am going to go to my layers on the right side here. So I'm in the Essentials workspace. On the right side, I'm going to open up this Layers window. And I currently have just Layer 1. I'm going to go ahead and rename layer 1 to be logo 1. So it's now logo 1. And when I do different additions, I may do logo 2, logo 3, logo 4, etc. So I'm going to work with logo 1 to begin with. And then I'm going to go ahead and start the design process. And so let's say, for example, I start with the rectangle tool here. And I make a rectangle. I'm going to actually make a square. So I'll hold down Shift and make a square. We'll say something like that. So that square right now is white in fill and black in stroke or outline. And I want to change that. I want to have no outline at all and just have a fill color. So I'm going to come down here to my fill color and stroke color. And on my stroke or my outline, I'm going to say I want nothing. So I'll click the little red slash. I know it's behind my head, so it's hard to see. And so I have no stroke. But under fill, I want to create <clears throat> some kind of a color. And I may evolve this down the road. By the way, next class we'll talk about color theory and why you would pick one color over another. Um, but in this case, we can pick any color that we want. I'll go ahead and start with uh, kind of an orange color, for example. Should show up nicely for you guys on the projector. So now I have this square. And I may want to do some transformations to the square to change the square. And so as we've done before, I could use the pen tool. I could click on Add Anchor Points. Let's say I wanted to clip the corner. I could add an anchor point to there and add an anchor point to there. And then I could remove an anchor point right there, and I could clip the corner. So I can use the pen tool to do these modifications. But there is another strategy for doing this. I'll Control Z to get undone here. And that is that I can use something called the Pathfinder tools. And so if I go to the Window menu item here, and I come down to something called Pathfinder, 
I get a variety of options here. And so under Pathfinder, you can see that I have shape modes. The first one is Unite. The second one is Minus Front. The, second, the third one is Intersect and Exclude. Okay, we're going to go through those options first. So for example, I'm going to use the square again. I'm going to draw a smaller square. And then I will rotate that smaller square at 45 degrees. Okay? And let me go ahead and make this color a little bit different so that it's easier for you to see it. So I have this piece. And if I move this on top, say there, when I go to the shape modes, well, let me move it so that it's sticking out to one side here. Okay, let's say it's sticking out to one side. When I go to the shape modes, if I select these two objects and press the first shape mode, it's going to add the two objects together and make one shape. So it's no longer the two separate shapes. It's made them, so it's, it's, it's bullying them together. So it's connecting them together. If, however, I picked the minus front, it would subtract the front from my shape. So now I have the square minus that little piece. The third option here would be give me the intersection of the two. So in this case, I'd be left with only the small little triangle. The fourth option is exclude. So where they overlap, get rid of that piece. So you can see, just on these transformations, I can do a lot of things with some basic shapes. And it ends up being a really easy way of creating different objects. So if, for example, I wanted the corner to be clipped, all I would have to do is put the two together and subtract the front, and I end up with the clipped corner. So it's a different strategy for how you would go about doing it. Okay, A little different, but it still works. So there it is. So let's say that I want to put some text in this box. So I'll use the text tool here, and we'll drag and create a box for the text. Uh, actually, in Illustrator, I don't have to do it. I can just click, and it'll, it'll let me start typing. Uh, let me put a capital G, and it's really, really tiny. So let's, let's change that. We'll start with 72. It's still too tiny. Let's come in here, maybe 400. Nope, bigger, 700. I'll move it. Maybe it's like that. You know, I still want it to be a little bit bigger, I think, in this case. Let's do uh, 1,200. Eh, maybe a little bit smaller. Let's try 1,100. OK, remember, I can use align tools, just like in uh, InDesign. So if I go to my window, and then I go to align, I can take these two objects, picking the, the G as my control object. I can align to the center and to the center, except that it's taking the whole object. So that didn't work. We'll just do it this way. OK, so now I have this. Maybe I want to cut this out so that it's transparent instead of having the black letter on it. I can convert this into an actual object by going up to the Type menu and saying Create Outlines. We did this, if you remember, in InDesign when we created the frame and stuck a photo in the frame. Same concept here. If I say Create Outlines, it will make an object out of it. And now I can take my two objects, go back to my Pathfinder tools, and I can subtract the front. And now that's cut out. The advantage here is if I had an object that was behind both, let's change the color on this, arrange, send to back, that's now a see-through object. It's easier to see that it's a see-through object. Okay. We also talked about doing these kinds of objects with the, the shadow on the right as one of the design trends. So I could, for example, create a box. We use the center here. That was larger than one side. I'm going to go ahead and make it uh, a darker gray. So let's go 0, 0, 0. And under k value, we'll do 75, 75% gray. And I'm going to take this object 
and come over to this transparency button here. And I'm going to change the blending mode on the transparency to be multiply. So remember, we did blending modes before. And so that's darkening this side of my object. Um, I think I might have to, let's try. I may have to cut it out so that it's not, so that it's providing just the half. So let me, hold on a second. I'm going to take my orange logo here, control C to copy it, control V to paste it. It's the same logo twice. I'm going to cut this logo in half. So let's go ahead and add a shape on top of this at the halfway point. There it is. I'll use Pathfinder on these two shapes to subtract what's on top. I get just this half. We'll change that color to be gray. I'm going to do 50% gray so it's not like that. We're going to change the blending mode to be multiply. And we'll drop this one over the top of that one. And we end up with the two-tone shape. So it's just another strategy. I thought I could get away with just the rectangle, but it's not, it's not making the, the white transparent. So in this case, maybe that's a little bit strong. We could drop that down to maybe 20%, 30%, right, to have just a little bit of the shadow as part of it. We could also come back and we could add more to the bottom of this particular shape. So at this point, maybe it's time to move on. And so I'll go ahead and go to the layers, and I'm going to create a new layer for logo 2. Logo 2. And remember, this is part of the design process. You have to play around with this. And so Logo 1 was pretty good, but maybe I want to try something a little bit different. So let's go again with the square. And maybe it's a matter of I didn't like the color. But again, that shows nicely on the board for you guys. So this time, let me go ahead and I'm going to make another triangle or another square here. Oops, I forgot to hold down shift. Something like that. I'm going to go ahead and rotate that at 45. A little bit too big. I'll transform it down. There we go. So I end up with the bottom so that I have that shape. Let's go ahead and select both of those. And I'll, in the Pathfinder, join them together. But now I don't want this to have fill anymore. Instead, I want it to have an outline. So I'm going to flip the fill to the outline. And I'm going to increase the stroke, uh, maybe 10. No, it's got to go more than that. Maybe something like that. I'm getting little funny results down here. Probably means if I were to use the direct select tool, I have more than one anchor point. Yep, there's two little anchor points there. So let's see here. It had to do with how I combined. Can you guys see that? Now, let, let me uh, change the color of this layer so that hopefully you can see it. Now you can see it. See that funny little piece that sticks out? I need to get rid of that funny piece so that this is smooth. So we'll go back to the Delete Anchor Point tool. And I'm going to delete there. Oops. Get rid of that. Get rid of that. Now that's nice and clean. We'll move over to the other side. There it is. And we'll get rid of that and that. So it was just a mistake on my end. Control-0 gets me back to that piece. And so now I have an outline this time. And so maybe I need an additional line that divides the two. So I'll draw a line from there to there. That divides one half versus the other. And then maybe I need the text over the top of it. 
We're going to do that G again. But this time I want a different font, so we'll go into the font list and change to something different. That is just awful, so we're not going to pick that one. Maybe this one's good. And I'm going to overlay that on this, something like that. Now, once again, I'm going to convert the text into an outline. So I'll go to Object, and then I'm going to, or excuse me, Type, Create Outlines. I now have outlines. And I'm going to flip so that it's outlined instead. Let's thicken that outline up a little bit. So I'll go to Stroke, so you can see it just a little bit better, something like that. Now, now that I have this, maybe instead of having this line go all the way through, I want it to start and stop there and there, or maybe I want two of them. So let's go ahead and change this down. We'll go to like 10 point, something like that. And let me create a rectangle instead, like this. Bear with me, something like that. Now I could take this shape and this shape, and we could intersect the two. So we'll come back to my Pathfinder. We're going to add those together. And I need to delete the original line. And now that becomes one object that I can then center in my overall piece. So you see how I'm kind of evolving this. And I have no idea whether I, in fact, like this or whether I don't like it. Maybe I don't like it transparent. Maybe the background needs to be filled. Uh, so in that case, maybe we fill the background, and then we intersect these two pieces to subtract that away. I don't, I don't know what the exact strategy is just yet. And uh, that's why it, uh, it takes some, some practice and some playing around to figure out what that strategy would be. And at some point, we end up liking our particular logo, or we show it to our neighbor and say, this is, this is our logo. What do you think of it? So today is very much about using the Pathfinder tool, playing around with these shapes, trying to create a logo that feels right to you. You can, of course, move into brushes and using brushes if you want. That's an option. Uh, we can use the shape, the, excuse me, the width tool that we did before if we needed to adjust width for some reason. Um, but I think the concentration on the Pathfinder tool is definitely uh, worthwhile. Let me just make sure I haven't forgotten anything. All right, don't forget part three. Show your logo to your neighbor. Get some feedback before you finish. Uh, and then ultimately, you're going to post your work for, to the co course website. And I do expect you to comment on this as well. Are there any questions? No? All right, go for it.